Okay. So welcome to the fifth dialogue of the DEC project. Today, our guest is uh, Ms. Leah Wyman, an eco-activist, climate change law specialist, and co-lead of Youth for Ecocide Law, which is a global network of young people committed to promoting and advocating for ecocide law. And it is part of the Stop Ecocide uh, movement. Leah, thank you, Leah. Thank you for very much for being uh, with us today. Um, the floor is yours. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much for having me. And also, yeah, hoping we can have a like a good discussion, considering there's only a couple of us to just, yeah, hopefully if you have any questions or anything in between. Uh, as per, yeah, I have a little PowerPoint for you to just give a little bit of background about the Stop Ecocide movement. And then, yeah, I know you have, might have some questions and we can have some further discussion. But yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. And I will start sharing my screen. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully you can see it. Yes. Um, perfect. So, um, well, you already gave a very quick introduction about me. Oh, is there anything? You can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm co one of the co-leads of Youth for Ecocide Law. Um, I'm also, yeah, I I mean, I have a, a lot of, I've done a lot of studies in recent years. I finished my LLM last year. So um, in international um, global environment and climate change law. And uh, now I'm actually starting my um, research studies at, um, postgrad research studies at the University of Cambridge. So I'm moving to the UK next week. So in lots of moving uh, situation as well at the moment. I'm originally from Germany, um, which is actually where I'm currently with my parents. But um, I didn't grow, grow up here. I mostly grew up in South Africa. Um, so a lot of background sort of from there as well. And um, yeah, so that's just like a very, very brief little insight into me. And um, but let's dive into the important topic of today, which really is what is ecocide and what is ecocide law. And uh, I'm just going to run through a couple of slides of suggestions what ecocide also might look like. Um, ecocide is mass destruction of ecosystems, as the word says. Eco means home, and side means killing, so it's the killing of our home. And in 2021, it was legally defined by an independent expert panel and that was convened by Stop Ecocide International as unlawful or wanton acts committed with the knowledge that there is substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by these acts. Yeah, so what does that, like, what does that really mean, though? It, the definition doesn't formally include any specific um, examples or um, set out terms of like this is for certain ecocide. Um, that actually has several reasons because um, actually there might be things happening in the world that could potentially not be included in a definition but are like really horrendously happening and then that would be yeah not so good if suddenly in the future is not included in the definition. So really it tries to encapsulate everything that is like sort of mass destruction um, without very specifically saying, okay, it's only these acts. But there are a couple of things just to make it more visual that we can sort of look at and see, okay, this is, you know, this is, this could be defined as ecocide. Um, things like ocean damage, industrial, large scale industrial fishing, oil spills, plastic pollution, deep sea mining, mass deforestation, mineral extraction, industrial livestock farming, palm oil and wood production, land and water contamination, oil spills, mining, tar sands, fracking, textile chemical industry, agricultural pollution, air pollution, chemical, um, yeah, disposal and weapons, radioactive contamination, industrial emissions. Yeah, things like that, basically. And the question is, I mean, all of these images and things, I'm sure, are nothing new if you yeah, looked into this topic longer, you know, and if you've watched the news pretty much. 
But the question is, you know, why does this happen? And um, I think it's a lot to do with how our current system is set out and how our current economic system functions and how sort of it sees our nature as a bank of resources, as something to be extracted and exploited, rather as this web of life that we are actually part of. And I think, you know, often also even environmental protection, we talk about, oh, we need to protect the environment, whereas actual or protect the earth. And it sort of almost implies that we forget that, you know, we are the earth and we are part of the environment that we're trying to protect. Um, so Ikusai wants to take that sort of a little bit more holistic approach of like also eco is like our whole environment and we are part of this web of life. So it's both looks at not just a um, protection from a human centric perspective, because a lot of our laws in general protect humans and human rights rather than environment, but it protect, looking at both protecting, yes, the human rights behind it, but also sort of looking at protecting the environment for the sake of protecting it, not just because it's useful to humans. Um, yeah, so let me click on the next slide. As we see, I think there's a lot, you know, all things are bound together, all things are connected, whatever befalls the earth, befalls the children of the earth. You know, there's a lot of quotes that we can hear from this from many indigenous leaders. And I think it really highlights that it's a very different perspective than our Western view of how we see the world um, and how we see as humans as connected to the world. Um, yeah, so how, but with all of that in mind, how can actually ecocide become an international crime? And how can we stop these, like mass, this mass destruction and these disasters from happening? So basically, Stop Ecocide campaigns to bring Ecocide into the Rome Statue of the International Criminal Court. And the current four crimes that are part of the International Criminal Court are genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, crimes of aggression, and the campaign is basically aiming to bring Ecocide as the fifth crime into that Rome Statue. Um, it has a sort of four-stage process that I'm quickly going to run through just so we have an idea, you know, what would what does that actually mean? How would it work to get it into the ICC? Firstly, it needs to be proposed. So any state that is officially ratified, um, so agreed to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court can come forward to the court and propose an amendment. Um, and they're basically, at the moment, currently 123 of these state parties that are um, have ratified uh, the Rome Statue and are part of the International Criminal Court. Um, and then secondly, what needs to happen is that a majority of those represented in the annual assembly and those voting have to agree that the amendment needs, can be considered. So they have to be agreed to, okay, this is a worthy amendment that we should consider. And then next, when they said, okay, we're going to consider it, then they need to vote on it. And that adoption requires a two third majority of state parties to agree to this amendment, which would mean at least 82 out of the 123 votes. So that would lead to then ratification. The so ones then that goes through, states have voted on it, then the state parties must ratify it. So they officially sign on to it. And that means that the law is not only as an international, like valid as an international law, but it will then automatically be included in their domestic legislation. So that way, through the ICG, you not o ICC, you not only um, tap into international courts, but through ratification, it automatically comes into um, national jurisdiction as well, uh, which is pretty, I think, a pretty exciting feature of the ICC, um, because that means that international law is not just cannot just be isn't only prosecutable at international courts, uh, but can also be like addressed in, in national jurisdictions and at national courts. So that also brings me very much to the question. So, okay, so this has happened domestically. Why do we not just ask all states to like sort of implement it in their domestic legislation as a law? Why do we need international law? Um, well, firstly, because you know, we have our environmental problems are very transboundary. <clears throat> that means that, you know, if there's an oil spill that happens, it's likely not to just affect 
one country, but will, yeah, impact neighboring countries, impact neighboring states. And that sort of make, creates this legal mechanism that can hold states accountable and can say, one state can say, okay, well, you created this oil spill um, or this person, this corporation um, has created this oil spill and we want to, uh, and it's affecting us, it's affecting our people, our environment. Um, and that also creates sort of political safety if you have it in international law, because it's not just one country that's doing it, but it's several countries. It sort of recognizes the concept that we're not doing it, others are not doing it. It creates sort of a level playing ground for everyone. But it also has a very important moral impact because, you know, yeah, maybe we can't say that automatically if it's in law, it won't happen. It's kind of like, you know, killing is illegal. That doesn't mean that killing doesn't happen, but it means that it will be brought forward to court and it will be prosecuted as such. And at the same time, you know, it's sort of that creates that moral thing that we all know is something that is wrong, but something that is against the law. Whereas currently the ecocides that are happening, they're not against the law. It's perfectly legal to kill the environment. And exactly with that is that something that we need to change, sort of to say that, you know, this is not okay. And it's not morally right. And sort of how creating that legal change also can help shift that moral change that a lot of people kind of intuitively know, okay, this is something that's wrong, but also then that is something that's in general at an international level recognizes something that is wrong. Um, and it also means that we can actually put some laws and regulations on businesses and industry, because like I said, currently what a lot of what things are happening, they're just legal. And profit is made from extraction, from exploitation, which means that, yes, corporations and organizations and business that want to make a lot of money will exploit and use that because there's no laws or nothing that says they can't do that. But it's actually also beneficial for businesses. There's a lot of businesses that have signed up to support um, ecocide law because it creates a level playing field. It creates sort of that baseline that all businesses say, OK, well, but it's something that's not allowed. So the businesses that will be doing better in environmental will actually be preferred. You know, they'll be, be ahead. They can create innovation um, and they won't be sort of, yeah, they'll be spearheading this, you know, this new um, economy and this new, um, yeah, revolution that we need for a sustainable world. Um, yeah, and I think that really is sort of leads me to, well, then, you know, what what is stop ecocide international and um and i think it's really come sort of out of that recognition you know we need to hold businesses accountable we need to hold corporations accountable and in individuals accountable that are creating large mass destruction and that led in 2017 um two people to start this organization polly higgins and um jojo meta which you can see in the picture um, Polly Higgins, unfortunately, um, is no longer um, with us, but the current executive director is Jojo Meta. And uh, yeah, so she sort of um, started this movement and now it's become a, yeah, it's a very big international organization. It's become a movement around the globe. There's a lot of um, sort of uh, local branches of it, all sort of also the youth branch, which is what youth side law is. Um, and but yeah, what do what do we actually do? So there's a lot of sort of high level advocacy and legal expertise happening, a lot of going to conferences, speaking to state leaders and state representatives to get them to know about ecocide and to support it so that then once it's brought forward at the ICC, there's a state recognition. Oh, okay, I've heard about this. Ooh, I support this, it makes sense. Um, and also just campaigning for that awareness but also to create that definition, which is why there was the, the independent expert panel was convened that came up with this definition that I read up to you earlier. Um, just gonna read it again, which is that ecocide means unlawful wanton acts committed with knowledge that there's a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. Um, and there's a lot of thought that went into this definition. Obviously, that's like not 100% sure that this is the definition that will then be adopted. 
there's obviously also criticism. Some people think it's too weak or it could be stronger um, or things like that. So there's a lot of discussion around that as well. So this is not really the set definition, but it's currently what is a lot of the experts that work within international law have seen as uh, the most, yeah, um, promising one to take forward. Um, and then there's a lot of international grassroots campaigning that happens, which is also a lot what the youth movement does is sort of create awareness about it so that people around the world know what is ecocide law and what is this pain stop ecocide. And they can go to leaders and to their government representatives and be like, support this. It makes sense. You know, it's about mass destruction of the environment. It's not just about, OK, like cutting down a tree won't be allowed. It's like. No, it's really the worst kinds of crimes of environmental destruction that are really being targeted with this. And actually, it's a very, yeah, sensible thing to do. You know, it's going to be very hard for leaders to be like, no, nah, you know what? Um, I don't support, especially in the current time, I don't, I don't support, like I support mass destruction of the environment. So this is kind of what the grassroots movement tries to do is to be like, okay, this is such a, this makes so much sense and um, we need the political support for it. There's also quite a few um, yeah, international people that you might recognize here in the pictures that have sort of in the one way or another sort of spoken their support for um, Stop Ecocide and Ecocide Law. And um, yeah, that brings me to the youth movement. I'm going to give a very quick background to how it started because actually the youth movement is pretty young. It started last year at Stockholm Plus 50, um, when the youth task was sort of um, brought Ecocide forward as their first demand. And from that, um, the youth group formed, um, the youth for Ecocide Law group formed. And um, yeah, sort of was like, okay, well, there's a lot, you know, where that youth, especially increasingly carry a voice within international um, decision-making places and to sort of demand for action. And it's also very important to say, you know, that we have young people that say, okay, well, but this is our future and we want this to be a law of our future. Um, so, yeah, a lot of global mobilization that you, maybe you've seen at like climate strikes um, or in the news or at events that already like have that sort of those posters up and that sort of campaigning for stop each side. So sort of saying we need a law that can protect the earth, that can protect us, that can protect our future. And uh, yeah, this is also a little bit, you know, what what can we all do? Especially if you like, let's say you don't want to join a mobilizing group. We actually have a very like broad network group as well. Just people who are interested in joining, but um, and currently actually recruiting for the core team. Well, that closes. If you are interested in that, actually, is something that's open as well, but only until the end of the month. So you have two days. If for some reason you sparked today to be like, oh, you know what, I want to like mobilize and be part of the core team. And uh, that's something you can do, but also something very easy that everyone can do is just to, you know, there's an international petition that can be signed, um, you know, and then just talking about it, talking about it as a concept to other people, telling people about what it actually is, starting a conversation. And and that can be, you know, any conversation about like, you know, what do you think of the definition? What do you, how do you think this would look in your national context? Um, because there are actually more and more states that are looking at bringing it into national law. It's been discussed to brought into Belgian law very recently. So there's a lot of states, especially in Europe, there's a big discussion in many um, countries to include it in the national laws. Some of them have included the definition that was proposed by the um, International Expert Panel, but not all. So yeah. Um, but like I said, you can also get involved. This is the youth um, email, but also there's a network, WhatsApp chat, and a uh, sort of on but also just to follow on like social media or on like instagram twitter linkedin tiktok all of those so yeah just if you want to follow along and find out more about like what's happening and how to support and this is one of my favorite quotes that i'm going to sort of end with which is you know never doubt that a small group of thoughtful committed citizens can change the world indeed it is the only thing that ever has and I think, you know, for me, ecocide law is really something that is inspiring because it isn't just saying, 
um, it's not just a demand, you know, it's really something concrete that we can put into law that could change the course of our future. And actually what's something that's interesting historically to look at when the ICC was founded um, after, you know, the Second World War, actually ecocide law was discussed to be included. Um, and then last minute it was left out. It was only included under war crimes. So that's a, that sort of say, um, yes, in, war t in times of war mass destruction, and it sort of came from um, the Vietnam War when a lot of destruction happened with Agent Orange, and then people recognized, okay, we need to prevent this from happening. Um, so it's included, actually, the word ecocide is already included in the Rome Statute. It's just not included as a standalone crime. And that's something that needs to happen. Because if you imagine, you know, what if this had been included like 50 odd years or so ago? You know, I think the world lo would look very different right now if like, you know, war crimes, like genocide, um, like crimes of aggression, this were an international crime. So I think with, with ecocidal, we can really leave a legacy um, for for our future, but also for future generations to come to say that can, you know, protect the earth. Um, so yeah, uh, that's a little bit of an introduction to Stop Ecocide and Youth for Ecocide Law. And now, yeah, it leaves me to have any questions from you. I know you have a couple of questions for me as well, and then we can have a discussion for that as well yeah thank you very much leah i have the microphone yeah okay uh yeah that's very interesting um let's let's firstly talk about you and your experience uh experiences uh first of all uh what was the point in which uh, you saw that you wanted to to follow this path, uh, the ecologist uh, path. Uh. Yeah. So um, it actually started pretty early, um, but it's something that is very interesting to note with that as well. And I think that maybe people who just meet me won't really like realize is that like when I was at school, I was actually pretty like shy. Like I didn't really like like speaking in front of big crowds mm. and people and stuff like that. And now I like go to these big conferences and give big speeches in front of a lot of people. So it's actually not something that is that I was born with or that came natural. Um, but then I learned about, you know, environmental destruction. I was living in Cape Town, South Africa. We had a lot of issues with wildfire, so with mm. droughts, with um, also plastic pollution that I saw a lot at the ocean, sort of really plastic from all over the world, washing out at the Cape and um, animals sort of being tangled up in it. And I realized, you know, this is something that I need to speak up about. And this is bigger than just me. Um, and I can make a difference with this. And I think, um, yeah, I was, I mean, I was like 13, 14 at school and it was really not so cool to talk about environmental issues back then. Mm. I think it's luckily changed quite a bit. That has become a lot more into discussion. It's become a lot more cool to be, yeah, to be caring about the environment, to talk about these issues. But it also built my character to sort of be like, oh, but, you know, I know that I'm talking about something that is meaningful. I know that I'm talking about something that's right. And I'm going to continue to, and I'm going to learn how to debate and how to talk about it. And I think the more you do something, the, yeah, the more it fuels sort of your passion, but also your skills. And I can really say that, you know, just by following my gut instead of seeing something seeing injustice in the world and being like, I'm not going to stay silent about this. Like it's completely changed who I am as a person. It's completely changed sort of my skill set that I have. Um, and it's built me into sort of build the confidence that I have now and also given me the opportunities that otherwise, you know, I don't, I don't think I would have studied like, you no, know, I already knew because I learned as a school, you know, I already knew, okay, this is something I want to study, but I wouldn't have studied any of this or gotten into any of these like organizations and universities had I not sort of gone with that like gut feeling of like I need to speak up about this and I need to um yeah I need to pursue this and um so yeah it really started with sort of seeing environmental and destruction around me but also seeing the beauty of nature and I grew up like you know very close to nature and spending a lot of time outside 
So um, seeing those sort of things that were like sort of wrong and seeing suffering really was like, oh, this is something that needs to change. And I don't want, yeah, I don't want this to to happen. So I need to do something about it. Yeah. Uh, you said about the conferences and all the events that, uh, how do the people um, react uh, to this idea, this movement? Because I would guess that everyone would be behind such a, uh, especially yeah. nowadays. Maybe yeah, 20 years uh, ago, you would be considered weird. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. No, you're right. Life, but... You know, right, there's actually a pretty big support of it. I've not encountered anyone. Uh, I mean, it's only grown really big over the last two years where it really has become into the discussion at the UN conferences. Before that, it was more a ground root discussion that maybe was more among people or maybe among academics, but not so much in official spaces. And now really it is being discussed among people at like UN conferences, at COPs and stuff like that. Um, so that's pretty exciting, but it's kind of new. It's only developed really over the last two years that has gotten to that level. And at this point, there's really like, there's not really anyone you will meet who will be like, no, nah, this is a bad idea. There will maybe be some people um, that will be like, you know, the definition could be stronger or something like that. So there will people that will like maybe say, oh, okay, I think this could be better here or like we could improve this or who want to, yeah, who see sort of different path that it could go, but there's no one who's like, oh yeah, who's there's no one who's like really, against it i've not really like met i've not been met with resistance in that regard so that's pretty exciting to be part of the movement i think at this stage because there's just like gone and so much like interest has got like just gotten up and so many people are like supporting it so yeah yeah there's progress and that's very important and yeah it will only get better yeah uh if anyone in the chat uh, has a question, they can write it, they can open their mics. Or a comment or something you want to discuss yeah. or whatever. Feel free, you know, guys. About yeah. the, wait, the definition mentioned, knowing that these actions may lead to environmental destruction, but does intent play a role on it? That's a good question, yeah. Um... I think that's a question that often comes up in sort of war crimes as well, you know, oh, you know, that something has happened, it was an accident, it was not supposed to happen. But, um, you know, actually, um, a lot of these crimes that we look at, um, they are intentional, like mining is intentional, like deforestation is intentional. Um, so, it's really, you know, yes, you need someone to prosecute, like you need an individual. It's about responsibility. In order to bring it to court, you can't just be like, okay, well, there's a lot of plastic in the ocean. We should sue someone. No, you need to like be able to prove, okay, yeah, it was caused by someone. And um, let me pull up the definition again and share it because I think this is very helpful when we talk about it. They will make it a little bit more um, visual. Um, okay, so ecocide means unlawful or wanton acts committed with a knowledge that there's a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long term damage to the environment being caused by these acts. Yeah, so that means with knowledge sort of shows that in the wording, yes, there is intention, you know, behind it. Um, so yes, they need to be able to prove, okay, people knew that they were causing. Um, potentially causing mass destruction. Um, yeah, may I add uh, that the intention doesn't have to be to destroy the environment, but yeah. knowing that what you do will make you profit but destroys the environment, it, it's still <laughs> yeah, it's still a crime. Uh, so see, for example, like it's like it just says with the knowledge that there's a substantial likelihood. So yeah, we know that if there's oil drilling, there is a lot, like there is a pretty big likelihood of oil spills happening. Uh, for example, you know, so there's as long as you like a lot of these environmental um, exploitation that happen, they it's known that it will it could cause mass damage. So and I think a lot of this what this law aims to do is not to have suddenly 
loads of courtrooms full of um, crimes being prosecuted, but it's actually to deter it from happening in the first place. So even now, actually, this is something that um, is quite exciting. Even before the law comes into place, it is something that can help shape it. So because if now it's becoming into discussion at international level, if leaders if corporations can see that this is going to be a law in the future, they can see, they can plan ahead, you know, they can already see, okay, if this in the future will be illegal, I cannot continue to do business as usual. Um, so really it's about deterring this from happening in the first place, from um, from switching sort of that business model. And that doesn't mean that obviously every probably there will be organizations that um will try to exploit until the very last minute that they can, but um there are lots that will realize, okay, well, we can't do it until the end because then we will face, you know, we, we could face legal prosecutions and legal consequences later on um, because we can't do the switch, you know. You said it earlier that they, they will have to innovate to find alternatives. For example, disposing uh, chemicals in in the water. They don't do it to destroy the water, but it's a cheap way to get rid of the chemicals. For example, I'm thinking about if the the political progress uh, continues about this issue, they will start finding ways to dispose chemicals, and so they will have to innovate. If I'm getting the concept right, and yeah. Sense. As long as you let let people do crimes, they'll do the crimes if they profit from. Yeah. And it's also like it doesn't really address like all environmental issues. And I think especially some of the climate change consequences that we see, um, such as like sort of sea level rise and flooding and things like that, maybe will be harder to prosecute via ecocide law. So it's not like a solution to like all the problems in the world, I would say, also because it is mass, usually will, it will be about mass destruction. So it's really about trying to stop the worst harms um but i think you know it's a good like it's a it's a needed ground level that we need to sort of establish and to say you know this, this is not should not be legal and this isn't legal so yeah um i think that's something important to be sort of be aware of as well yeah okay maybe it won't solve like all our problems uh but <laughs> it should be the bare minimum you know of what we should stop uh, Hermione. Hermione just messaged something. Yeah, uh, I was thinking of more indirect examples such as floods. Being ah, you saw the question and you answered. Uh, such as floods co being caused because humans interfered with pre-existing lakes, for example, to minimize diseases. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think I, we. Yeah. Pretty much did. I don't know if you want to add anything. No, I think I tried to answer everything, but I don't know if there's anything like I don't if there's anything with like minimized diseases. I don't really understand that part of the question. So if you want to clarify that, if you want to go more into that, then yeah, Ramoni, if if uh, the answer didn't cover something, uh, right, uh, yeah, right again your question. Um, considering call okay at the. Considering all your colleagues you have met in uh, Stop Ecocide International, not just the lawyers. Uh, we'll come to this, uh, Hermione. Uh, how I want I want to show to our participants who are young, etc., uh, that uh, they can pursue this and uh, they could uh, find organizations to volunteer to work at a later stage. Uh, what would you say is needed as a personality, academically, I don't know, to to be on this uh, field and to fight environmental issues, etc.? Yeah, I, I think um, it really depends on like personal interests as well. So, for example, I got involved in like the Stop Ecocide movement kind of a little bit over a year ago so i've not been in it that long also because it formed stockholm plus 50 like last year so it's a pretty new group 
but um, the the youth movement especially. So before I actually heard about it because I like yeah you know, I was studying international relations and sustainable development uh, in Scotland, the University of St Andrews, and uh, sort of I sort of through sort of especially through studying international relations, I sort of learned about international law and realized you know a lot of these. I really want to focus more on how can I how can we use law and how can we use policy and um to like hold people accountable and to create new parameters of what's allowed so that then really brought me into the wanting to study like went to the legal field and then I went to uh, law school at the University of Edinburgh where I started um sort of my LLM and there I yeah we sort of actually we ended up talking about ecocide law um in class and that's how I found out about Stop Ecocide. And I was like, oh, wow, this is so cool. And I thought of saw it as like just a very concrete like movement and solution that just seems very simple, you know? It's not like super complex because a lot of things in climate change are pretty complex and even the solutions are really not that easy. Um, and I was like, you know, this is like something that is exciting that is in a field, an area or field sort of in terms of like, yeah, for me in law, that is very easy to get involved in. But you don't really even have to like study like law to be involved in something like Stop Ecocide. Um, a lot of the people that are in our group and aren't that are just like, okay, well, but this is a legal solution. I want to have laws that, you know, protect it. So I don't really think you need a legal background to, for example, stop support, stop ecocide, or even get involved in it. Um, kind of just how it happened with me because we were talking about it in class and um yeah I think so it really like obviously there's a lot more opportunities out there nowadays to get involved in environmental initiatives but also means there's a bigger pool of people in general that are interested in this so it like it can't harm to like really like try and like hone your skills in that area that you want to do and there's so much, like basically you can like any interest area you can transform or connect to environmental issues. Um, so for example, like if you're interested in communications or interested in like, um, yeah, in social media, things like that, there's so many jobs coming up and like, how can we best communicate climate change? How can we best communicate climate change solutions to the public? Um, or like, even if you're like more into like art or things like that, actually we're currently creating like an art book with youth for ecocide law because we're saying okay well but you know yes this is a very like yes it looks like a very, very legal campaign and everything but actually how can we use creativity um to raise awareness about what's happening and um it kind of like stems from my passion because i wrote a book of poetry on environmental issues not on like ecocide specifically but on like you know environmental issues so a lot of them you know definitely include ecocide but um sort of that was because and it kind of happened while I was studying my undergrad and I was just like writing about the things that I was learning about and seeing in the world and it ended up sort of being in like poetry format and I was like you know what I should do something without about this because we need to talk about this in like all contexts whether you know it's in like an informal context or like in a more formal setting whether it's like work or job related or university related so I think it kind of really depends on like your area of interest, but I think any area that you're interested in, you can make, um, you can get involved in environmental um, movement, even in health. Like my mom's a um, doctor, she's a pediatrician and she actually does a lot of work in campaigning in um, raising awareness of how health is related to environmental issues. And because she deals a lot with like people who have asthma, for example, how that's connected to air pollution and how even diseases, you know, such as like diabetes and things like that are connected to environmental changes and how a lot of that the healthcare system really is at the front lines of what is happening of climate change. Because if environmental disaster hits, people are going to like, you know, get sick, are going to, and those people that are already sick and are in hospital um, will then have to deal, you know, with the consequences. Staff will have to deal with the consequences of a lot of, you know, things, whether bad, weather happening, um, or like, for example, like water shortages, um, 
can be really big problems for hospitals, for example. So like, I really think there's such a big variety of like how to get involved and where that like, it's hard to say any like strict formula of this is what you should do follow. But I mean, the more skills you can build in your area of expertise, the better. Mm -hmm. I have a question because I was wondering how you um, lobby or influence or whatever to the recognition of the um, ecocide crime. I mean, how you ended up in these COP conferences or in these UN conferences mm -hmm. and this kind of thing. Yeah, um, a good question as well. Um, it's a bit complicated, especially, well, I've mainly been to climate conferences. Actually, last year was my first COP that I went to. I went to um, the COP27 in Egypt. And um, so I was really part of Stop Ecosite at that point and spoke at quite a few of the like sort of side events. Um, and then I went to something more technical this June, which was the SB58, which is sort of the intersectional conference that happens between the big like climate conferences that actually like, not many people know about, but they're pretty important because they sort of set the agenda for what will happen at COP. And that was pretty interesting because it was like quite technical and there wasn't as much, you know, side events that are happening with people like at COP, like there's a lot of stuff happening, like a lot of side events. So people like will speak on all sorts of environmental issues and have speeches on it and talk about it. But actually what the SB conference showed me um, in June was that, you know, um, a lot of the lobbying or like the campaigning that needs to happen is talking directly to country representatives. So what I did with a lot of the other Stop Ecocide representatives that were there, and there weren't that many there because obviously it's kind of hard to get people into conferences in general, but um, the two or three other people that were there, what we did is like sort of approach country representatives and speak to them about ecocide law and say, you know, take it back to your delegation, take it back to your country representatives. And um, yeah, and that sort of grow that support. So a lot of it is literally just approaching people, speaking to them about it and being like, support it. And because then we are in the corridor discussions of leaders and of negotiators that are there that can then bring it internally to the discussion that brings awareness to the topic people will know okay well this is something that's being discussed um so that's something very important that's happening also with youth sort of we try and like bring it into youth policy papers for example um into advisory like um papers that will go forward or be like supported by younger or wrote out at conferences or at COPs or be presented to leaders, um, which I think can carry um, weight as well. There's a lot of, there's a big fight within you, like for youth in general, that not, you know, even there's more and more opportunities for young people to like maybe go to conferences, but we're there as observers. So that's something that's still like kind of frustrating at times. I'm not going to lie because you're there and you listen to all these people negotiate, but you don't really have, like you can listen, but you don't really have like a, the power to create any change or sometimes even the power to speak up. Like sometimes they will have spaces where they will allow young people to speak, but most of the time it's not really. So that's something that needs to change. Um, but it's something that is actually already being criticized a lot, you know, to not have like that tokenistic inclusion of young people. And I think that's something that if you're going to get involved in the future in different initiatives to look out for as well, you know, you don't want to just, be involved in something and be like yeah I'm a youth voice but you know to have like really push for okay I don't just want a microphone you know I want you to really listen and mm. to have these changes be implemented so yeah mm. I think there's a lot that goes into it and a lot can be done um but we also try and work a lot with partnerships so for example maybe some people will have heard about world youth for climate justice and they work on bringing in another different legal solution that looks at bringing an advisory opinion to the International Court of Justice, which is a slightly different court. And um, they sort of have a, like there's a, obviously a slightly different goal and perspective, but mm -hmm. it's also legal solutions is actually headed by similar small island state. So it is like we try and collab with groups like that and really try and like how can we have all these movements that are happening come together and push for changes and how can we support one another so it's a lot about sort of looking at partnerships as well mm -hmm. um but yeah mobilizing on the ground to get people in the public aware 
and then really going up and approaching like leaders or youth representatives for countries and be like, bring this to your government. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, let's go back to Hermione's uh, question because I, I get what she wants to ask. That, for example, in Greece, in order to fight uh, malaria, they drained lakes, etc., because mosquitoes would uh, go there. And, uh, of course, that, after some decades, uh, creates problems like uh, flooding, uh, etc. That's yeah. a bit tough, because that was a policy that was followed at the time with the knowledge they had at the time. Yeah. I don't believe that they would expect the Thessaly to to be completely underwater like a month ago. Yeah, that's pretty bad. And we see a lot of this happening. Um, you know, these policies that, yes. And I think this is kind of a thing that we in general see happening. The more we progress into climate change, the more people are going to try and do damage control without realizing like quick solutions, without realizing the long-term solutions. That actually means, you know, we need to, we need to, create climate we need to like have climate action and climate infrastructure because with climate change that's a known fact that diseases are going to spread it's a known fact that we are going to get more malaria even in europe um so yeah i think it's something that is definitely frustrating but one of the things that is also important to be aware with ecocide law it's not something that can be acted retrospect retrospectively so let's say the law comes into place in two years you can't be like, oh, five years ago, this happened. Unfortunately, that's like something that like, you know, won't be possible because it's not, the law is not retroactive at the ICC in that sense. Um, and so where, we'll, where would you start? <laughs> I mean, exactly. all the things we've done to the planet, what? Yeah. What? Because then people can be like, well, but, you know, back then the law didn't exist. So it can only happen. It can only be prosecuted, unfortunately, at the time where doesn't happen but what can happen now is you can talk to representatives and be like well you know in the future this could be ecocide so don't do that again <laughs> any, any okay questions? That, ah. any questions does anyone have any question for fiber no hmm. I think we covered it pretty thoroughly as well. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And my perspective on it is at some point, an ecocide, uh, ecocide will be considered a crime. But what I'm afraid of is that it will be too late then. I mean, what is too late? You know, I mean, we can speak about Maybe it. It's, already, too late, it's you know? getting late. We can say, the time. oh, okay, for a lot of environmental things that have happened should never have happened in the first place. And yes, it's too late for saving this or that ecosystem, but it's never too late saving what exists, you know? And I think we can I, always I take that, that perspective on climate change issues in general below. Like, oh, it's too late. Yeah, it's too late for some things, but that doesn't mean that we can't change, like, we can't, like, really reduce mass suffering in the future. So, yeah, I mean, of course, the sooner we have it, the better. So, and I think that's with a lot of environmental things that are being campaigned for, you know, the sooner we can create some of the solutions, the better. But actually with ecocide, I don't, you know, this is, this is in the discussions at a high enough level that it could become reality in the next like years. Um, and yeah, obviously legal things always take time, but actually that's uh that's a pretty big promise, uh, promising step that we're seeing, so it's promising development. So, yeah, I mean, uh, because now that the whole effects of climate change, etc., are pretty obvious to anyone, it's not like a B-list issue that a uh, few discuss. Yeah, we are all discussing about the climate, etc. Yeah, the momentum is here. Uh, the the awareness is building, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised in a few yeah. years. Have the support is there. Problem. The support is there. I think now it's just making sure that this is what, like, I guess the pressure on our side is making sure that we get as many states that sort of are on the ICC as possible to support it, because it makes no sense to, like, we have states that have already raised it at the UNGA. Vanuatu did so last year. And Vanuatu and other island states could very easily bring it forward to the ICC. But you want to bring it forward when you know that you can get a majority. 
Yes. So yes, while there is in general a very big support of it, no one like says no to it to your face. You want to have that formal. You need to have that security to be like, okay, we're going to propose it, and there's a very very high chance that it will go through. So I think at the moment is really making sure that we have these discussions around the world and we are targeting states to support it. Yeah, I mean, uh, having the support of the society, it's not enough. There must be enough support so that states are forced by their people yeah. to to follow. Yeah, that's a different uh, line of uh, working, a uh, tougher one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but we're seeing it being proposed sort of at, even at the EU level, was proposed at the... Um, the legal committee suggested it, but that doesn't mean it's like, you know, now it's being discussed and before it would go through for all member states. That's a whole other issue. But, um, for example, now we see it's being incorporated into Belgium law, for example. So there's states, it has been discussed in France before as well. But, like, you know, there's states that are literally taking this up in national legislation, which is actually a reinforcing fact as well, because yeah. if states are already taking it into their national laws, then... Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, is there any question or should we leave it here? I don't think the chat has any question. Uh, Carmen, do you have any question? No. Okay. Uh, Leah, thank you very much for being with us today. It was very interesting. It's yeah. a great movement. Uh, I really liked your presentation. It was very inspirational. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm glad. Thank you so much. Wait, let me... Uh... Let me share the links actually um, that I okay. joined for uh, that I said about you know the email address yep. people want to get involved mm-hmm. um, and then also um, and we can promote it uh, the yeah the the, the social business. media and the WhatsApp chat for the network which just has like general updates and mm-hmm. ways to get involved okay. also on the website there's like um, there's a toolkit that we recently bought out like a youth toolkit um so people can like yeah it's like really um yeah join like really look at that toolkit how to um promote stop ecocide um like on social media for example and things like that so that's on the youth website that i just shared the link for as well so great okay let me save that too because it will be lost when the yeah when the zoom yeah. is over Make sure so you yeah. save it. i'm copying them I'm trying to copy, to copy it, but I don't know why I can't copy. Oh, copy sometimes it. Zoom does it just. Um, I, I have copied it. everything. I can't oh, see. okay, okay. Oh. There's also the toolkit, so that yeah. might be quite useful for you. We literally just put this out for New York Climate Week, and there's also something we're developing. So we want to include some other stuff. So if there's any things that you like, okay, maybe include something. Like we want to include more on students as well, like what you could do at university level. Um, but this is just a general toolkit for like young people how you could like what you could post on social media. Like it has graphics you can download and share um or in general how to talk about it or common questions that are asked about ecocide law a little bit about the movement in general so yeah hopefully it'll be very useful so thank you thank you very much uh, everyone in the chat also i hope next time to see you all and uh, see the others as well uh thank you again leia i think we can say goodbye for mm-hmm. today Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Bye, Take guys. care. Have a good Bye, rest Leia. of your evening. Have a good evening. Bye, Leia. Thank Bye. you so much. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>